It's good to think about all the time the Buddha spent searching for the Dharma, all the energy that went into that, and then all the time and energy that went into spreading the Dharma, people remembering it over the generations, passing it on. Now it's been passed on to you. And they pass that on so that you would have a good idea of what a skillful intention was, and what an unskillful intention was, and the importance of the difference. So you're going to let them down, make up your mind that you're going to be intent on developing concentration which means being intent on the breath, staying with the breath. And trying to maintain that intention as consistently as you can. Because all the Buddhist teachings are on intentions. There was one time when a member of another sect was accusing one of the Buddhist lay students saying, how can you follow this teacher? He teaches nothing. He doesn't answer any of the big questions, what they considered big questions at the time. Whether the world was eternal or not eternal, finite or infinite, that kind of thing. And the student said, no, it's not the case that he doesn't teach anything at all. He teaches the difference between skillful intentions and unskillful intentions. That's what it all comes down to. All his teachings on causality, all the discernment teachings have to do with intentions. He taught causality not in general. He's not concerned about the causality that operates, say, pulling the orbit of the moon around, making it so erratic, or the moons of Jupiter. Is concerned with causality as it relates to your intentions. Starting with ignorance is fabrication. What are fabrications? They're intentional actions. And from there we can go to suffering. Or if we bring knowledge to those fabrications, we can come to the end of suffering. So your intentions are powerful. They make the difference between whether you're going to suffer or not. So we work on concentration, one, so that we can see the mind more clearly. Why do we want to see the mind? Because we want to see what it's doing as it forms an intention. All the qualities that are to be brought to bear in getting the mind into concentration, mindfulness, alertness, ardency, are focused on your actions, your intentional actions. Mindfulness keeps things in mind. So you can recognize when something comes up. Is this something to be developed or is this something to be abandoned? Alertness watches what's actually coming up. But again, not just what's coming up, what you're doing and the results of what you're doing. And then ardency tries to do all this well. It's what pulls mindfulness into the right orbit, pulls alertness into the right orbit, focused on your skillful and unskillful intentions, what should be done about them. So you try to your best to develop the skillful ones, abandon the unskillful ones. And in so doing, you bring the mind into concentration. Here too you're paying attention to your intentions. How's the breath going? How do you stay with the breath? That requires fabrication. The breath itself is a kind of fabrication. You can breathe in all kinds of ways. You're not stuck with just any one way of breathing. And there's nothing in the Buddhist teachings to say that you just let the breath do what it's going to do on its own without interfering. 
He says you train yourself to breathe in a way that gives rise to rapture. You train yourself to breathe in a way that gives rise to pleasure. You train yourself to breathe in a way that steadies the mind when it needs to be steadied, that lifts the mind up when it needs to be energized. So you take advantage of the fact that you do have some intentional input into how you breathe. So you can breathe in a way that helps the mind to settle down. And there's direct thought and evaluation, verbal fabrication. You direct your thoughts to the breath, you evaluate the breath. How's it going right now? Does it feel comfortable? Do you have a sense of the breath in different parts of the body and how all those breaths can all be connected? When there's a sense of comfort, how do you maintain it? How do you let it spread? And once it's spread, how do you keep it enlarged? You find that you're evaluating. You have to picture the breath to yourself. This is where we get into mental fabrication, the images you hold in mind. These two you can choose. You choose them in such a way that gives rise to a feeling of pleasure that saturates the body and then can maintain that sense of full body awareness, full body pleasure, full body breath. And then see how long you can maintain that intention. There will be other thoughts coming in. And there may be a voice in the mind that says, well, I've done okay for so far. I can take a little time off. Well, those little times off, they can turn into big times off. So instead, you want to watch what's happening. What does the mind want when it goes off like that? Because that's the whole point of an intention. You act because you want something out of the action. We're not machines that simply obey some sort of impulse without knowing why and without having a purpose. Our minds calculate what kind of actions will lead to pleasure, what kinds of actions will lead to well-being. That's what we want. And what the Buddha is teaching us is he teaches us right view is that we should think about the long term. As John Lee would say, anybody can find pleasure in one way or another. Even common animals find their way of finding pleasure. But it takes discernment to realize that there are long-term consequences to our actions. And you can have to take into consideration the fact that your actions are depend on your motivation. and that your actions can have consequences that last for a long, long time. Which means you have to check your motivation for why you're acting, and try to act in a way that will lead to long-term well-being. This is what makes human beings different from animals. We can take a longer view. Yet there are a lot of people who refuse to take that longer view. That's precisely why the Buddha made the point of rebirth part of mundane right view. That you've got to take this into consideration. Your actions really do have consequences. And there is continuation beyond death. And your actions play a huge role in shaping what's going to continue, how it's going to continue. So his teachings are all about the power of intention. To help you realize that you've got plenty of power right here, or the potential. If you use it well, you can, it can take you all the way to the total end of suffering. That's the basic message of the Four Noble Truths. And the role of intention in that is so important that the Buddha, even though he didn't 
make a habit of going around and arguing with people, would argue with people who, who taught teachings that would deny the power of your intentions. Those who said that there really were no actions. Action was illusory. Or there were actions, but you weren't free to choose. Or your actions couldn't make a difference here in the present moment. Those are forms of wrong beauty. He had to clear away. So all this comes pointing to what you're doing right now, what you hope to get out of what you're doing right now. So examine those things. It's one of the reasons why we try to maintain a single intention as we meditate. You get to look at it from many angles as you try to preserve it, because it's going to be challenged. Other thoughts will come in, other intentions will come in, and you have to have good reasons for saying no to those others. And so look at the reasons you give. Try to give good reasons. The Buddha gives you lots of ideas for what a good reason would be. But see what works in your own mind to ride with this intention, to stay with the breath, as continually and as smoothly and as solidly as you can. 